the Lord for being able to be here myself. Appreciate the choir. Appreciate all that goes into a Sunday. All the behind the scenes serving that it takes. And folks in the nursery and everything else. Praise, praise the Lord for them. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 20. Many of you know this verse probably by heart. Let's look at it anyway. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. According to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd help me now to say just exactly what you'd have me to say. I pray that you'd fill me with the Spirit. I thank you for my heart being already stirred, Lord, by these good songs and just all day. It's been wonderful here to be in your house. And I pray that you'd do it again here during the preaching time. Let it be an encouragement to somebody tonight. And we'll praise you for it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said... Doesn't it seem like sometimes that bad news is all that seems to be around us? You ever get to feeling like that? Seems like we're surrounded by bad news. Politically, uh, lying, deceit, abuse of power, etc. fills the headlines. Economically, rising inflation, the subsequent cost of living going up dominates the news. Morally, horrific story after horrific story of sin and degradation comes across our feeds. Even in our own little town in just this week, we see these things and it grips our heart. It upsets us. Bad news. Spiritually, the compromise of modern Christianity combined with the rise of America's overall lack of faith. You know, the, the largest group, as they run these surveys, the largest group that's growing lately is the group that just says they're nuns. N-O-N-E-S, they're none. They're no religion. They're no belief. They're no faith. That's the fastest rising group in America. And so when we hear those things, it seems like bad news is all around us. Bad news can wear on you. How many of you know that? When it seems like it just keeps coming, it can wear on you. Now, it's not as bad as this. I heard one man, uh, he had been waiting to hear from the doctor and he had been waiting to get a hold of him and finally got on the phone with the doctor and the doctor was just very blunt with him right off the bat. He said, I've got bad news and worse news. Now, I've heard bad news and good news. It's very often, but not very often you hear bad news and worse news. And the guy said, well, well, what's the bad news? And he said, well, the bad news is you only have 24 hours to live. The man said, oh, my word, what could be worse than that? He said, I've been trying to get a hold of you all day. <laughs> That's bad news and worse news. And I know that we get overwhelmed sometimes with bad news and it seems like worse news. So I want to come tonight for a little bit and I had two people ask me if Becca made me mad this afternoon. And I had one text me and say, how are we doing? I said, I think we're going to be okay. And uh, she did, to be honest with you, right when I stepped in the door at the house, she unloaded horrible news on me, didn't you? Very smart to do it right when I got home. So God had all afternoon to get that out. And uh, I think we're going to try and give that encouraging message that I had on my heart. And that is that I want to give you some good news tonight. We get bad news, seems like every way we turn. Let me give you some few pieces of good news tonight. First of all, uh, I want to give you this good news. God is real. You say, well, we know that. I, I know you do, but every now and then you need to hear it said. All right, Proverbs 14, 1 says, The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Not everybody understands what I just said to you. Not everybody believes what I just said to you. And listen, even in the life and the heart of a Christian, it's not always as real to us as it ought to be that our God is a true and a living God. He is not some made-up thing. He is not some fable. He is not some good story to help us through our hard times. No, our God is real. Many of us believe that Superman was real and Spider-Man was real and the Ninja Turtles were real. And we found out when we got a little older that wasn't the case. It was disappointing. There are many things maybe we believed when we were young and we find out later they're not real. The old saying is if something seems too good to be true, then it often is. Isn't that right? And if I were to lay out everything that we believe about our God, you know what it would sound like? It would sound too good to be true. But I got good news for you tonight. It is true. Our God is real. He really sits on the throne of the universe. He really is so big. He can measure the universe in the span of his hand. Hey, that's not made up. He is that big. He can rest his feet on the earth as a footstool. And that is our God. And he is a real God. In Revelation 7, verse 9 and 10, John said this. After this, I beheld and lo, a great multitude which no man can number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the lamb which clothed with white robes and palms in their hands they cried with a loud voice saying salvation to our God which sitteth upon the throne and unto the lamb hey I want to say to you lift up your head Christian God is real that's good news isn't it give you another piece of good news God cares 
1 Peter 5, 7, casting all your care upon him for he careth for you. Let's just be honest. Uh, what would be so good about the news of a real God if he didn't care about us? Right? Do you remember me telling you about that Muslim girl that got saved? So how many of you remember that story? I told her about a month ago. I was with her in New York and she had gotten saved. But before she got saved, she had read her book, that Koran, and she wanted to know about God. By the time she finished reading her book about the God, quote unquote, that's in that book, you know what she said? She said she would rather go to hell than go to his heaven with him. That was the God that she got a picture of out of her book. Hey, listen, I'm thankful for this. We have, and the reason was because to there, he would, she would just be a slave. She would be mistreated. Heaven for her wasn't going to be a good thing. You know why? Because that God didn't care about her. But aren't you glad when we read in this book and the more we learn about the real living God, what we find is he's not just real and big and powerful, but on top of all that, he cares about you. And he's so big that he fills the universe, but he can still see you right here. The little speck of dust that I am in this world. He sees me and he cares about my life. God is real and God cares. You matter to God. Matthew 10, 29 says, Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? That's nothing. That means they were of no value. One of them shall not fall on the ground without your father. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. For fear ye not, therefore ye are of more value than many sparrows. A sparrow might have been worthless to this world, but they matter to God. And listen, and you might think nobody in the world cares about you, but I want you to know you matter to God. Hey, the world would have looked at our house, the Shirley house, and they would have said, that's another bunch of Shirley boys. They're going to grow up and be wicked and wild and drunks and drug addicts like all the rest of the Shirley boys have been. And there were 10 or 12 of them, and they had all been that. And they would have made a right judgment if they would have made that choice. Hey, and they wouldn't have thought anything about that house. But listen to me. There's a real God in heaven, and he doesn't look at us the way the world does. And he didn't look at that house the way the world looked at that house. And he looked inside and said... If I get in there and I start working in there, I can make a difference there. And he did. You know why? Because he cares. The old song said his eyes on the sparrow and I know he watches me. Glory. Me and Brother Michael talking this week about that. uh, uh, Times that, that we needed something. And out of the blue, just out of the blue, without even telling anybody, a text or a call would come. And I don't mean just, you know, that's kind of close. I don't mean that, you know, maybe it could be interpreted to help me. I'm talking about right on time and the exact thing that I needed as if God himself picked up his phone and sent me a text. As if God himself picked up his phone and gave him a call. Right? You know what that is? That's the fact that there is a real God and he really cares for you in your life. That's good news. Psalm 34, 15 said the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous. It's good news that God is real. It's good news that God cares. But it's good news that God is able. Our text here, look at it again in verse 20. Now unto him, God, that is able. You ought to underline is able. To do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Unto him be glory. Listen, we're not taking any glory. All the glory goes to him. But I am telling you tonight, it's good to know these things. It's good to know that he's real. It's good to know that he cares about you and your life and what's going on. And listen, I think really, to be honest with you, this, this is maybe the best news. I'll tell you why in just a minute. But it's that he is able. He is able. The old song said that. He's able. He's able. I know he is able. I know my Lord is able to carry me through. I would say to you again, uh, this would be the greatest news because if God was real and God cared about me, but he was some weak and feeble being, then, then what good would that be? If God was real and God cared about me, but he was so far and so distant that he couldn't be a part of my life, then what good would that be? So really to me, the greatest news is this, is that there is a God that is real and there's a God that cares about you. And beyond all of that, he is able. You say he's able, able to do what? We'll get to that in just a minute. But he is able, the Bible said, to do. Notice that it said he is able to do, but it didn't make a specific claim about what he can do. The reason I believe that the Holy Spirit wrote it like that is because you can just fill in the blank with anything you want and God is able to do that. He is able to do whatever it is that you need. Another song we sing sometimes says God can do anything, anything, anything. God can do anything but fail. Isn't that good? 
God is able to do what you need. On any given Sunday, we come in here, and not only the people that are in here, but people that are tuning in and live stream, and they come with a diversity of needs. On any particular day. you got people that have spiritual needs, no doubt, every week. You have some that have physical needs. We make prayer requests about them over and over and over. And some that have financial needs and marital needs and parental needs and emotional needs. And we can go on and on and on and the needs are real. And the needs are many and the needs are heavy sometimes. But I'm thankful that our God is able to meet every need that you have in your life. Hey, that's not fake. That's not made up. That's not psycho babble or something that you might get from somebody to trick you into feeling better. I'm telling you, the good news tonight is there's a real God. And he cares about you and he's able to do whatever it is you need in your life bless his holy name he's able to meet all those needs at the same time i've been listening to a a song by the steels in the last uh, six months or a year it's called a hundred different altars i I remember the first time i heard it thought it was a little strange you got to really listen to it but boy you get down to that course and it says something like this it says a hundred different people at a hundred different altars a hundred different lives are torn apart They're bringing him their illness, confessing their addictions, praying for their children, and healing for their hearts. At a hundred different altars, one loving God of mercy meets them all. (laughs) Isn't that good? Hallelujah. Hey, all over the world for Sunday, I know the times are different. Hey, but all over the world on this Sunday, there have been Christians gathering together. And many of them with heavy hearts and serious needs. And they've come to an altar and they've cried out to God. And it's been all over the world. And guess what? He has heard every cry and he can meet every need all at the same time. A hundred different people, a hundred different altars. One loving God of mercy meets them. Oh, God is able. Everybody say, God is able. Yes, he is. Somebody might think, how can you say that with such confidence? Well, I can say it because I know a couple of things. I know he's able because he's knowledgeable. He's knowledgeable. In other words, he's qualified in whatever field you need help in. To the sick, he's a great physician. To the confused or confounded, he's the counselor. To the fearful and afraid, he's the prince of peace. To the lonely, he's the friend that's sticking closer than a brother. If you need direction, he is the way. If you need correction, he is the truth. He is knowledgeable. He knows what to do. If you don't even really know what you need, did you know he can meet that one? You say, well, how, how can he meet a need if I don't even know what it is? Well, if you'll remember in the book of Daniel chapter 2, there was a king that had a problem. He had had a very disturbing dream and it was bothering him and he was dying to know what it meant. The only problem is he couldn't even remember the details of the dream. So he called all of his magicians in and his soothsayers in and he demanded of them that they, number one, tell him what the dream was and then tell him what it meant. Well, they said to him, they said, King, nobody can do that. If you tell us what the dream is, we can probably interpret it. So, but there's, there's nobody in the world. By the way, they were right about that. There is nobody in the world. So there's nobody in the world that could both tell you the dream that you can't remember and what it meant. And listen, the king got so upset, he said, destroy them all. He said, he said, just kill all the soothsayers, kill all the Chaldeans, all these wise men in the land. And that would have been Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and they would have been killed as well. And Daniel heard about it and got with his boys and said, hey, we better pray and we better ask God if he can help us right here. And guess what God did? God said, Daniel, I'll give you the answer. And Daniel said this. He said, he is a God that reveals the deep and secret things. He knoweth what is in the darkness and light dwelleth with him. And he was able to go to that king and said, oh king, you don't have to kill everybody because God in heaven, he knows what you can't even remember. You say, I don't even know what my need is. God can meet that one. How about that? Because he is not only able, he is knowledgeable. And listen, I can say to you that he is able because I know he's capable. Mark chapter 10 verse 27, Jesus looking upon them saith, with men it is impossible, but not with God, for with God all things are possible. Jeremiah said this, ah, Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power and stretched out arm. There is nothing too hard for thee. In Luke chapter 1 verse 37, the angel Gabriel said this, for with God nothing shall be impossible. Our God is able because he is capable. He's not only capable, he's competent. 
all the way back from the very beginning in the creation. Over and over, the Bible kept saying that it was good. He created this, he'd look at it, and he'd say it was good. In verse 4, the light was good. Verse 10, the earth and the seas were good. In verse 12, the grass, the herbs, the trees, and the fruit were good. And it goes on and on all the way through that chapter until you get to verse 31. And the Bible proclaims there, and God saw everything that he hath made, and behold, it was very good. He is capable and he is competent. Jesus said about his father, Mark 7, 27, he had done all things well. I can very confidently say a hundred different people at a hundred different altars, the one loving God of mercy meets them all and he is able because he's knowledgeable, he knows. He is able because he's capable. And listen, he's able because he's reachable. Once again, it wouldn't be much help to have this all-knowing, all-powerful, caring God if we couldn't get to him when we were in need. Somebody might have a a relationship with somebody in politics and they might have a friendship with somebody that's in a high place of of authority and find themselves in need in their life. And and they know, they just know that if I could talk to that friend, if I could get to that friend, they have the authority to help me with this problem only to find out that the, the phone is busy or the phone is not answered and they just got too much going on and I cannot get an audience with that person. Hey, then you know what happens is that relationship didn't do them any good. How much power that person has isn't doing them any good if, they's not, if they're not reachable. But I got good news. I came tonight with good news for you. Hey, listen, our God is not only all-powerful and all-knowing and all of that, but listen to me. He is reachable. He's knowledgeable. He's capable. But he's also reachable and touchable and available. Amen. You can get to him. He'll hear you. He'll hear you when you cry. Psalm 34, verse 17, the righteous cry and the Lord heareth. Peter wrote, for the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and his ears are open unto their prayers. God will hear your earnest cry. Josh McDowell, some of you heard that name. I don't really know much about him. I just read this illustration about him. He said he was attending seminary in California. It was 2,300 miles from his home back in Michigan where he'd grown up. He said his father went home to be with the Lord while he was in seminary said that his mother had died many years earlier, but that Josh was not sure of her salvation. said he became depressed, thinking that she might be lost. Was she a Christian? Was she not a Christian? He didn't know. It said the thought obsessed him. He prayed, Lord, somehow give me the answer so I can get back to normal. I've just just got to know. The story I read said to him, it seemed like an impossible request. Now mom and daddy are both gone. How would he... He's 2,300 miles from where she lived. How would he ever find anything out? A couple days passed and he went over to the ocean and he walked out to the end of the pier to be alone. Brother David, you go ahead and come to the piano if you would. I'm going to have you just play for the invitation and then they'll come sing after that. He walked out to the end of the pier alone and there sat an old woman in a lawn chair and she was fishing. After just a little bit, she saw this young man and she said, Hey, where's your home originally? She asked him where he was from. He said, Michigan. Then he said, Union City. And then before she could say anything, he said, nobody's heard of it. I tell people it's a suburb of, and before he can answer, she interrupted and said, Battle Creek. Kind of surprised him. She said, I had a cousin from there. This is what the lady said. Did you know the McDowell family? (laughs) He said, I'm Josh McDowell. And she was amazed. And she said, well, I'm a cousin to your mother. Immediately he said, do you know anything about my mother's spiritual life? Do you remember anything about that? She said, well, sure I do. As a matter of fact, your mom and I were just girls, teenagers, when a tent revival came to town. She said it was the fourth night of that revival, and we both went forward to the altar and accepted Christ. The book went on to say, Josh began to shout, praise the Lord, so loud it startled the fishermen sitting around them. You say, what was that? That's a real God. Come on now. A God that is real. A God that cares and a God that was able. And you understand this, nobody else, nobody else in the world could have helped him with that. I was thinking, Miss Kelly, I was thinking about Daniel's funeral and how I was struggling with that. I remembered him living for God as a teenager and I remembered a time when he was sold out and fired up. You know, I believed that he was saved. I had asked him myself many times. And, uh, but I just was burdened to try to be a blessing to the family. And I remember just thinking, Lord, I wish you'd give us something. I wish you'd give me something. I found out later, by the way, Leah had said something to the Lord in the shower that morning. She was struggling with it. She said, I wish I could just see something to let me know for sure that he's in heaven. I believe it was the day before, the day before the funeral, wasn't it, Becca, that we started getting those texts? 
we started getting a text from a girl who lives in Florida who used to live in New York that when she was a teenager used to come to meetings here for our camp meeting and our youth rally. And uh, she started texting us that morning. We hadn't heard from her in 10 years probably or more. 14 or 15 years maybe. She started texting Becca and me and texting Becca I think and she started sending us little clips of a letter that Daniel had written her 14 years before when he was in a he'd put himself in, in a home out in Oklahoma where I go and preach every year a place for young men to try to get their life straightened out while he was out there he was doing well he was writing people letters and him and her had had I guess some kind of relationship in the past so he had written her a letter she started sending us little excerpts from that letter and had Bible verses in it and everything it was very encouraging and her story was that she, uh, now listen, she'd lived in New York when she was getting those letters. She's already moved. She's married. She's got family. She said earlier that week, she was cleaning out a drawer and found that letter. And then she said, as the week passed on, she saw on Facebook uh, the, the, uh, the, the notice of his funeral. We was going to have his funeral. And it shook her. She thought, my goodness, what are the chances that just this week I found that letter and now he's passed away. So she went and found the letter and started looking at it. And when she started seeing that good stuff about the Lord and the Bible and stuff, she started sending us pictures. I had to go and visit, I think, Brother Ken, I think somebody in your family had passed right about that same time. And I was going to visit somebody about that might not have been you, but I was going to visit somebody else that same day that had a funeral. And as I was driving over there, I was thinking about that letter. And then I thought to myself, I said, I thought, I wonder if it, I wonder if it says saved. I texted Rebecca, I said, ask her. Ask her if that letter says, and then I just said, no, don't ask her nothing. Tell her to take a picture of the letter. Send me the whole thing. So whoever I was visiting wasn't home. So I pulled the truck off the side of the road and started reading it. And the letter was written right after 9-11. And so all that craziness that happened. And he wrote to that girl something about, he'd said a bunch of good stuff about the Lord. And that was a blessing. That was very encouraging. But then he said this. He said something about, he said, wasn't that wild what happened there, in, you know, at 9-11? He said, Something like, what an exciting time to be alive. And then he said this, what an exciting time to be saved. Amen. Wrote it with his own hand. I just, about, I just about flipped the truck over. You say, why is that such a big deal? Well, I'll tell you what it was. God hid that letter for 14 years. I want to just go ahead and counsel all you women to get rid of all letters from any man you might have had a relationship with before you got married, all right? I'm going to be honest with you. I'm talking about how it's a miracle from God, but if I was her husband, I wouldn't think God had anything to do with the fact she kept that letter from that old boy. And God hid that letter. Think about it. She had already moved, and it moved. And he hid it, and he brought it to her attention the week that we was going to need it. I have no doubt God did that for Danny and Kelly. No doubt. You know why? Because he's real. Absolutely real. Because he's, he cares and he is able. You couldn't, have, you couldn't have made that happen. I didn't tell, I told Becca and I didn't tell none of them. And I put it on the screen in his own handwriting. It was like, it was like God wrote us a letter. He is able. The psalmist writes, as cold waters to a thirsty soul, so is good news from a far country. And I pray this good news is that God is able has been used to refresh your heart and your mind. And don't forget, we didn't even get into the fact that